it is a blessing to have the guitar back. Earlier in the week when I emailed John the book and let him inherit the title was No Righteousness by Observing the Wall. And then as I got to thinking about it, I was like, that's a little crap. So the title today is Total Depravity. You and I live in a litigious society. The courts, specifically those tasked with civil are growing and a moving to become. Television romanticizes lawsuits. Attorneys advertise their specialties. You can find an attorney who specializes in only car rights or only car rights. Or your workers come. Or you name it, you can find an attorney who specializes in that specific type of lawsuit. Verdicts render create precedents that affect every area of your life. Think about some of the warnings that we see on everyday products. Fish hooks. Do not swallow. <laughs> They're not warning the fish because that's the point for the fish to swallow it. If you've got to be told not to swallow a fish hook, Keep the fish away from you. But you and I have to live with the precedence that these lawsuits create. I mean, think, think about, what was it, 2003, 2004? Somebody sued McDonald's because they still coffee on themselves and it was hot. Unless you're buying an iced coffee, guess what? It's going to be hot. In many ways, our culture resembles that of the world the Apostle Paul. Court proceedings are routine and familiar, just as they are for us. You've got Judge Judy, you've got Judge Mathis, you've got Judge whoever. Those were tight knit communities. Cases were publicly tried. Today's text we see that Paul borrowed from the language of the courtroom to paint the picture that he had in mind. The words of Scripture do not come in a vacuum. It's not as though Paul was just having this ivory power moment where he was completely separated from everything that was going on in the world. No, he knew his culture, he knew his society, he knew that which his audience saw every day, and he used what they saw to paint the picture, much like Jesus used parables of the Gospels. And those parables, Jesus used everyday things to present a message. This morning we have three points. We have the divine economy, we have the testimony of Scripture, and we have science. Romans chapter 1, verse 9. Romans chapter 1, verse 9. No, I said it twice. Romans 3, verse 9. I tried to correct it the second time, and it still came out wrong. And I've got a really huge bold three right there. Romans 3, verse 9. I'm saying it slowly, more for myself than for you. What then? Are we better than they? No. In no wise. We have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you. We thank you that 
even in an indictment of guilt, that there is hope. For you don't give your word to people who are completely hopeless. Rather, your word lands exactly where it ought to land. And it produces fruit in that good soil. Because you know those who are yours. We were once those who were without hope and without God in this world. But now, You have revealed yourself and declared yourself and given hope. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The divine economy. So what we're we seeing here in chapter 3 is a distinction. We're seeing a contrast, if you will. In the first half of this chapter, which we looked at last week, we saw that divine economy, and in this part of chapter 3, we're seeing spiritual and moral fitness. So, you have the divine economy versus spiritual and moral fitness. The what advantage of verse 1 contrasts with the are we better than they of verse 9. answer that Paul gave in verse 2 was much in every way. Verse 1, what advantage? Verse 2, much in every way. Paul pointed to the Jews' possession of the law. He pointed to their practice of circumcision to show that they had an advantage over the Gentiles. They were without excuse. These days, the Jews' special revelation, which they rejected, resulted in wrath and no advantage in facing judgment for sin. So the advantage is the Jew has special revelation. The, the advantage is that the Jew hears the message of the gospel. The advantage is that the Jew sees the law looks into the mirror of the law and sees his utter sinfulness, his depravity. But if he rejects, if he rejects God's call and God's standard for holiness and chooses to remain in that, then there's no advantage in having that law. There's no advantage in the practice of circumcision. In the third part of this chapter, Paul presents a Jew's distinctive position in the divine mind. One was able to Paul says in verse 2, much every way, the Jew has an advantage. But in verse 9 he says, for we better than that. And a skeptic, the Senate, might say, well, there's proof that there's contradiction to the Bible. But if we understand the first eight verses, we understand that Paul is presenting the distinctive position of the Jew in that divine economy. One way of looking at the Jews is to say that they were God's jewels. God did not call them out because they were better. God did not call them out because they were in any less sinful. Read the pages of the Old Testament. And you'll see that the, that the Jews were just as sinful, just as wicked, 
Egyptians to pray as those of the nations around them. In fact, they were worse off because they had the revelation of God. They had the covenants. They had the promises. They had the patriarchs. They had the law. And they rejected all that. Paul now in verse 9 and following addresses the Jews standing before God and the manner in which they fulfill their God-given role. He says, Jew, you have the God-given role to be his jewels. How are you going to fulfill it? He says, are we better than they? And if we understand ourselves to be better than they, because of all this stuff we have, because of our own works, then we have no advantage over the Gentiles. For we have the full proof, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. What is sin? You probably heard preachers say that sin is simply missing the mark. That's it. Loosely, that's a that's a way of transliterating the Greek. The Greek word for sin is harmartia. And so preachers who say sin is missing, missing the mark recognize Hormar, Martia, transliterated Martia, the mark. And they say sin is missing the mark. What is the mark? The mark is God's standard. The mark is God's holiness. God has a standard that's right here. Guess what? There's not a one of us in this room that fits a measurement of the standard. There's only one who ever measured up in this standard. His name was Jesus. And he went to the cross. God poured out your sin and my sin upon him. He bore your sin and mine in his body. He alone made the mark. And he died for you and me who missed the mark. Both Jew and Gentile are under sin's sway and condemnation. The Apostle's argument is based on understanding and recognizing human conduct and character. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3. And we'll pick up the 22nd verse. Galatians chapter 3, verses 22 through 25. But the scripture has concluded all under sin. All under sin. That's total depravity. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should have afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is done, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. What is the part? What's the possibility here? He's basing his argument on an understanding of human conduct and character. Your character and mine is shaped by the fall of Adam. Adam was the only human being who was created perfect. Adam was the only human being who had free will. But the moment he reached forth and took that fruit, his will became not free, but bondage. And you and me in Adam have a bonded will and bonded hearts. So what's the testimony of Scripture? 
verse 10 of chapter 3 of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. And here we see the four nuns. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seek it after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together to come unprofitable. There is none that do good. No, not one. In those four nuns, Paul gives a very clear, a very distinct assessment of your character and mine. A very clear, distinct assessment of your conduct and mine. Then he goes on to describe what those nuns do. He says, Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they abuse deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace. Have they not known? There's no fear of God before their eyes. Paul is writing primarily to Gentiles here. Remember this is a church. And it is primarily the Jewish. The Jews, including Jewish Christians, were expelled from Rome overnight and became a Gentile church. At some time later, the Jews were allowed to come back and there was friction. Well, not with those who formerly been in power and now those who are currently in power. The Gentiles are outnumbering the Jews. And in writing to these Gentiles, he doesn't laugh on reference after reference, but he is very, very selective in how he references the Old Testament. He uses the Old Testament to substantiate that which he has established. We see representative sins. In these verses, we see sins of speech. Notice his use of the words throat, tongue, lips, mouth. Our mouths are wells of deadly waters. Psalm chapter 5. Psalm 5. Psalm 5, verses 3 through 11. My voice shall come clear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I direct my prayer to the day, and will look up. Without thou art not a God that hath flesh and wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. We saw that in Romans 3. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will afford the blood of the deceitful man. But as for me, I will come to thy house and multitude thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship for thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, and thy righteousness, because of my enemy. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their evil part is their wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter their tongue. Destroy them, O oh God. Let them fail. Let them fall by their own counsel. Cast them out of multitude of transgression, for they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let Joyful in thee. Turn also to Psalm 140. Psalm 140, verses 1 through 3. 
Delivering, O Lord, from the evil man, preserving from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart, continually are they gathered together for war. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adam's poison is under their lips. Say it. Or stop and sit. Then turn back with me to Psalm 10. All three of these psalms we see quoted there. Romans 3, 10, 10 to 18. Psalm 10, verses 7 to 11. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the working places of the villages, in the secret places that he murdered the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor, but he draws him into his net. He crouches and humbles himself, that the poor may fall by his strongholds. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see it. Not only do we see sins of speech, but we see sins of violence. Paul speaks of bloodshed, of destruction, of misery, and the absence of peace. Quoting from Isaiah 59. I hope I did y'all a favor by not marking these verses myself. Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 8. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot say, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not fear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleaded for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hash cockatrice eggs. And we the spiders with he that eateth other eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out of the vital. Their web shall not become garments. Neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet are their feet run to evil. We saw that in Romans 3. And they make haste to shed innocent blood. So that also, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their past. The way of peace they know not. Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1, verses 10 to 19. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us work privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as, they, as those who go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in our water among us. Let us have one purse. My son, walk not in thou wet, now in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they taste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread beside any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily, privily for their own lives. So the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. So what's the root of the problem? What is the root? Of it? We know that the problem 
shows itself forth in sins of speech and in sins of violence. Watch the news. Watch any sitcom. Take time to be a people watcher this week. And you will see clearly the sins of speech and the sins of violence <coughs> on full display. Look what's happening right now with the pro abortion crowd. Actually, securing the location of our justices and then going and heckling them. Especially after one of our justices had an assassination attempt on his life. These are folks who are filled with violence. If they cannot kill babies, then they will kill justice. Or they will kill anyone who gets in the way of killing babies. The root of the problem, though, is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. The problem isn't their sense of speech. The problem is not their sins of violence. Those are just manifestations of the problem. Those are merely the fruits of the problem. The problem is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Turn with me to Psalm 36. Psalm 36, one verse. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. That's the problem. That is the very problem in our culture today. There is no fear of God in our culture, in our society, in our nation. If there were a fear of God, we wouldn't have the riots in the summer of 2020. We wouldn't have assassination attempts on justices. We wouldn't see much of what we see on the news night after night after night. We wouldn't see what we see in sitcoms and entertainment. Some of the divine depravity is simply by simply saying, not that man in his natural state is as bad as he can possibly be, but rather that his entire being is adversely affected by sin. That's the way Edward Harrison in the Bible commentary is about. He defines depravity as not that man in his natural state is as bad as he can possibly be, but rather that his entire being is adversely affected by sin. And folks of that ilk would say, well, even Hitler didn't kill his own mother. The way I define depravity, total depravity, is that apart from the grace of God and given the right circumstances, you and I are capable of any heinous Sin. So, given the right circumstances, Hitler would have killed someone. Apart from the grace of God, and given the right circumstances, you and I are capable of any heinous sin. Have you ever heard the phrase, 
There, but for the grace of God, go on. When you flip on the news, watch the sitcom, or when you're out, people watching, think about that. Because how easy is it for you and me to forget where we came from, forget that which the Lord has done in us and through us and continues to do for us, and look down our noses. The reality is there, but the grace, but by the grace of God, go I. Apart from God's grace, And given the right circumstances, you would be doing the exact same thing as the one you're watching is doing. That's total depravity. You and me are utterly, utterly depraved. Let's think about the backdrop of the corporate. Let's think about the, the backdrop of what Paul's dealing with as he's painting the picture for these Roman Christians. Let's think about that backdrop of a litigious society in which folks are brought into the courts, whether civil or criminal, as we read verses 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law said, it said to them who are under law, that every mouth may be stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul is asking, are godless Jews? Or not Paul. Somebody reading this, somebody hearing this, would ask Paul, are godless Jews represented the whole nation? Paul paints a pretty dark and a pretty stark picture. And so somebody hearing this, somebody reading this, might be tempted to say, well, but are you necessarily referring to the entire nation of Israel? Or are you just painting a picture of those who are God-less? Remember the world that Paul came out of. Paul was steeped in religion. Paul was steeped in the law. Saul of Tarsus thought that he was in the center of God's will. But he had shaped an image of God in his own mind, in his own heart, that he thought was right. And he was corrected on the road to Damascus. God thought, or Paul thought that he was following God, when in reality, Saul of Tarsus was Godless. Because Saul of Tarsus had not received the Messiah, had not acknowledged the Messiah, had not acknowledged that the Messiah is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Scriptures. The law speaks to those who are under it. Saul of Tarsus was under the law. The Jews of the first century were under the law. But by and large, they were godless because they elevated the circumcision and they elevated the law to an idolatrous position. They made these things that God gave them for their benefit and their blessing into God's little G. And they took their attention off of the one true living God. There is no room for pride when man's work is measured against God's requirement. I'll say that again. There is no room for pride when man's work is measured against God's requirement. God's requirement is here. And what does Paul say elsewhere? 
not man's works, not man's righteousness. Filthy rags. But Paul said that all of man's righteousness was filthy rags. The English language actually cleans it up. When Paul says that our righteousness in and of ourselves is filthy rags, literally, it's not just it's not just a rag that Matthew, you and me might wipe our hands with after working on the car. That's a dirty rag. But rather, and this is going to be a little grotesque, but this is literally what Paul was saying when he said that your righteousness is as filthy rags apart from Jesus Christ. Your righteousness is not the best you and me can do it, all of the grace of God. Is like menstrual cloths. That's worse than a rag that, that you and me would use to wipe our hands after work on the car. That's literally what Paul said. Now we know that what things soever the law say. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. The guilty verdict demands silence. You know, when Paul said, once you were in that court proceeding and the exchange was going back and forth, and once you had nothing more to say to your own defense, the custom was that you would place your hand over your mouth. And the prosecution needed to be won at that point. You would place your hand over your mouth as a sign the case is done. The verdict is guilty. We won't take time to turn to Genesis 18, verses 22 through 25. Point to the earth's judge. The Lord God is the earth's judge, and he is right. The Lord God is the earth's judge, and he is right. The whole world is accountable to God. Lottie, Dottie, and everybody is accountable to God. As we saw in Romans 1, we will have general revelation and special revelation. Even those who have never heard the gospel, the fact that they have general revelation, the fact that they can look out and tell that there is an intelligent design, that there is a creator behind all this, leaves them guilty before God. The fact that the, the lost have general revelation makes them accountable to God. The fact that the Jew has special revelation. And the covenants, the promises, the patriarchs, the law, the prophets makes the Jew accountable to God. Do you and me who live in a culture that for a long time has predominantly been Christian? You and me, we hear the gospel over and over. We hear the special revelation. You and me are accountable to God. Turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 16 and 19. John 7, 16 19. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but it is the set. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. 
He is seeking for himself, seeking his own glory. But he is seeking his glory that sent him. The same is true. No unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go you about to kill me? Jesus says to those Jews, Moses gave you the law, but you don't keep it. Not only are you not keeping it, keeping it, but you are going against it, and you devise your plans to kill me. If this is where we left off, we would have a very hopeless sitch. We would be left with our hands over our mouths, like those in that first century Roman courtroom. But they've got nothing else to say to their defense. But there is hope for you and me. Though you and me are depraved before God, though you and me, apart from the grace of God, and given the right circumstances, are capable of the most famous of sins, there is hope for you and me. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 6, 15 and 16. Galatians 2, 15 and 16. We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of Gentiles, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No flesh is justified by the works of the law. But, justification comes in Christ. Is your hope in Christ? Do you know justification in your heart, in your life? Because, because of the faith of Christ? Notice how Paul words that. No man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Ordinarily, you would be say what? Faith in Jesus Christ. Paul words in the faith of Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received it not, but as many as received it, to them gave him the right to become the sons of God. Why would Paul say in Galatians 2, chapter, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, the faith of Christ? Because God chose man, Abraham. God chose a nation, Israel. God chose a Messiah, Jesus. Jesus, in himself, accomplished what Israel never could accomplish. Israel was God's chosen nation, but the nation could not accomplish that which God intended. Jesus, as an Israelite, as a Jew, Accomplished what the nation could, could not. The faith of Jesus Christ is Jesus working, living as a representative of Israel. Fast forward to chapter 3 of Galatians, verses 1 through 9. Paul said, No foolish Galatians, who have been wishing. That ye should not obey the truth. For whose eye, Jesus Christ, have been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This is only what I learned. Receive ye the Spirit of the Spirit by the works of all, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, for ye now made perfect in the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Either it were that minister to you the Spirit, which worked in miracles among you, do it again by the works of the law, or by the truth of faith. You may, even as Abraham believed God was accounted for righteousness, 
Know that you therefore, they were which are of faith, the same are children of Abraham. Abraham believed God in his record of his righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. They which are of faith were the same children of Abraham. Do you believe God? Then like Abraham, God reckons it to you as righteousness. In the scripture, we're seeing the God who just by the heathen through faith preach before the gospel of Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So that they which be of faith are blessed with faith of Abraham. In verse 10 and 14, for as many as from the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that can do not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So that no man is just by the law outside of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Side of the back. The just shall live by faith. It's never, 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 never been about obedience to the law. Because even when Moses descended from the mountain, with those stone tablets, God knew that Israel could not hold that standard. But rather, those tablets were the schoolmaster for Israel to point Israel to Christ. And the law is not a faith, but man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of all, he made a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. You and me were cursed apart from God, but Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the one who knew no sin, took your curse upon himself when he hung on that tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on you. The Gentiles, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then Psalm 143. Psalm 143. Verses 1 and 2. Psalm 143, verses 1 and 2. David writes, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication, and my faithfulness answer me, and my righteousness, and enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man live be justified. Do you know this hope today? Do you know what it is to be justified today? Do you know what it is to trust in the one who became a curse for you? Who took your sin upon himself? Don't let this day pass without knowing that. Don't let this day pass without knowing the justification that comes in Christ. And you too can live by faith. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that it's your goodness that calls us to repentance. Lord, call us. Draw us. Redeem us. Sanctify us. And one day, glorify us. In your name we pray. Amen.